we're going to have Ray Salea. Ray, why don't you come up and uh, introduce the next pa the panel here and uh, what we're going to be covering in the presentation. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to add. I know I know uh, Rick introduced uh, Colonel Suarez uh, pretty well, but I'd like to just add a few things because uh, they're they're important for me anyway as a retired military guy. Um, he has over 35 years of military service, has served in traditional and non-traditional assignments. In 1996, he graduated with distinction from the University of Minnesota's ROTC program, and he, is, and he has been deployed several times to Bosnia, Sarajevo, Iraq, and Kuwait. His military awards and decorations include the Bronze Star, Meritorious Service Medal, and the Army Commendation Medal. So, an, an officer who has served his country worldwide. With that, I'd like to introduce um, Rachel, uh, Matt, Rachel Madzak from Comcast. So Rachel, real quickly here, uh, Rachel Madzak is the Senior Director of Talent Acquisition at Comcast, NBC Universal, where she leads national professional recruitment. Throughout her career, Rachel has led talent acquisition, talent development, and human resource teams in companies ranging from mid-size to Fortune 30 and national and global companies, B2B and B2C organizations. She is passionate about matching the right person to the right career and building organizational talent pipelines through, uh, pipelines through uh, uh, program, pr purposely. So, um, Rachel and her husband are very busy raising their four school-aged children and advocating for juvenile diabetes. Uh, our third panelist is um, Isaac Contreras. And uh, real quick here, I want to uh, make sure we, I think we've all, those of us who, who have uh, worked with Rick over the many years know Isaac, because Isaac is very engaged, uh, not only with helping organizations like ours understand the market, but also the communities that, uh, that he serves. So real quickly, Isaac is a Minnesota-born Hispanic real estate uh, estate professional in the Twin Cities. He is the founder and CEO of M CML Group, K Keller Williams, Integrity Realty, with over 25 years of experience in operations, sales, and team leadership. Isaac has been uh, developing and advocating for the best interest of his peers and teams with a traditional yet effective philosophy. He he attributes to his, his success to a simple, do, do not let them outwork you. So, uh, way to go, Isaac. Uh, attitude since the days, since his days in the Navy. Thank you. Uh, when, he, when he and his wife, Bridget, uh, of more than 25 years are not guiding their three grown sons, and, and which one of, them, one of them is with us today, uh, the three grown uh, sons, and enjoying their grandchildren. Isaac is serving the community over, over, uh, serving over the years. Isaac, belief, belief in here, here to serve um, has led him to have an impact through community service. He has, done, he has done so through engagement and involvement in many organizations. So thank you, Isaac. With that said, what I'd like to do now is um, take, uh, take the clicker here. And now that we've introduced our partners. Um, so I'm going to go back a little bit here because I would like to um, just talk about the discussion. So we're, we're here to discuss over the next 20, 25 minutes now, strategies for recruiting and retaining talent in disruptive times. It's really picking up where Colonel Swat has left off, and that's why he's a member of our panel. We're really taking a close look at this from leaders who actually have done that and hopefully uh, they will transfer to you some ideas, concepts, maybe even some strategies for your organizations. So what I'm going to do is ask three probing questions, three probing topics, and ask the panel to, uh, to really get into a conversation. And in that conversation, we hope you, you harvest some ideas, some gold nuggets you can take with you. I'm going to start with, with Rachel, and, and Rachel, uh, for you to begin, and then I'll ask the other panelists to go ahead and add, to the, add comments to Rachel. So your topic, Rachel, is the strategic role of ERGs, mentorship, sponsorship, and allyship in developing and retaining multicultural talent. Please help us. Awesome. 
Well, thank you. That's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> so hopefully we can uh, chip away at that. But my absolute pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, so just thank you for the time. Thank you for this opportunity. And the presentation um, prior to this was pretty incredible. So I hope to just build off some of the nuggets that we've been talking about today. Um, as mentioned, I, I lead professional recruitment. So my day job, we're out there, we're looking, we're building marketing plans, and we're trying to find the next best talent out there. Um, but truthfully, you know, some of the strategy really needs to begin internally before we go out to market, before we start to you know, find that next talent. And, and we touched on that a little bit in the presentation earlier. Um, and so that's where you see some of these strategies in play in the question really, really shine. And so I think we talked a little bit about you know, knowing yourself from the inside out. Um, who are you as an organization? What makes you tick, right? It's our employees. But what about the employees? What about the leadership? What are the attributes that we're looking for, that we're growing, that we're cultivating? And most importantly, do employees understand what it takes to be successful there? Do they see themselves there? When you start there really at the core of identifying who you are and how you build careers at your organization, that's when you layer on some of these other strategies like sponsorship, like mentorship, like ERGs. Um, we've got a handful of our Comcast ERG members here today. Um, and allyship, because this is where this is where the magic really comes into play. You know who you are. You know how to grow it. You know how to help it thrive, um, and you know how to and when to speak on their behalf when the employee isn't in the room. They've got that voice. They've got that that leader really advocating for them at all times. Um, and so for me, that's where it begins. Um, and, and from there, when you're very quite clear on those programs and those strategies and those opportunities to keep your employees thriving, now we know how to go build that recruitment strategy. Now we know what the profile looks like and where our real opportunities may be, and we can build you know, the recruiting pipeline um, to, feed into the, to feed into the strategy. So I think that's how it all kind of works together, and that's where we've seen real success around employee development, retention, and then ultimately recruiting. Thank you, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Isaac, would you like to add any comments to, uh, to Rachel's thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Ray, for uh, inviting me to the panel. I, you, know, you can get me to start talking. That's not a problem. <laughs> get me to stop. Sometimes can be. Um, but the one thing that I do really enjoy about the concept of the ERG is you have access to not just a name, but to the, and, and not just necessarily a profile uh, in a black and white folder, but you can actually dig deep into and ask those questions of who are you, where are you from, what are you thinking about, what is thriving in your definition, in your, in your world, compared to others from cl different cultures. Um, and, and having that access and being able to provide uh, leadership in that where it's not just uh, a boiling pot of complaints but action oriented to achieve I think that having that access and being able to promote it as such is a, such a powerful thing should your desire be to grow should your desire be to retain if you're thinking about it as oh, that's a good idea then it, then it's then it's there's no fruit to bear and so I think when you promote it, when you identify it, and really are willing to ask the deep questions, even though you may not be interested or may get your feelings hurt by the answers, I think it's a huge opportunity to, to be able to have that ERG. Thank you, Isaac. Colonel Suarez, any additional comments? Um, I'll just add, we, uh, we, we had eight councils in, in Minnesota Guard. One of them is our Women's Council. Uh, this year, was it, was it our 10th, Chris? Or, 10th, 11th Women's Leadership Forum. Um, this year we hosted it at uh, Medtronic. We partnered with our real urban companies. Uh, it's an opportunity to create a forum for uh, our women leaders to uh, have a chance to for personal develop, development. It's also an opportunity for seeking out mentorship, sponsorship, allyship. But uh, this last year, uh, some of the folks from that council uh, did a survey with the organization 
we just published the results of that survey and, and mentorship was one of the things that came up. Um, I would say this, you might think you've got a good program going, but until you ask for feedback, yeah. maybe you don't really know for sure. And the feedback was pretty brutally honest. And well, we've got work to do. Uh, the mentorship program, the Minister Guard, needs to be really retooled and formalized in the organization. But again, willing to take feedback, maybe people say feedback is a gift, right? Uh, it was great to hear from that peer group on where we have work to do. So that was valuable, and we've got work to do in Minnesota Guard. But um, uh, again, mentorship is really, really one of the outputs mm -hmm. of the ERGs. Um, so uh, I echo that. That's awesome. Thank you, Colonel. I, uh, I often hear the term, find your voice in your organization. Find your voice. What we just heard is strategies, approaches to helping that individual, especially new members of your organization and new multicultural members of your organization, help them find their voice within the organization. I'm going to take it to the next uh, topic, which, and I know you can't read the talk, topic behind the panelists, but I'll read it for you. Okay. Commission, communication strategies for meeting the needs of a multicultural society. And I'd like to start with you, Colonel Suarez, if you could uh, give us your thoughts on that. Well, I think it starts uh, how well you know yourselves, and Rachel, you made a good point about, you know, hey, if you don't believe in your own brand, that's a bad starting point, right? Um, but the Minnesota Guard's been around for a long time. Um, we have been in it for a long time. We're really proud of the organization, not because we're perfect, because we're always working on being better. Um, so we believe in the brand, and that comes out in our messaging, right? Um, I think it's really first and foremost that you have to believe what you're selling. Um, do you know the market you're selling to? In our case, it's twofold. It's our members who currently serve, and it's the communities that potentially have uh, applicants that want to serve in the Guard. So. So messaging and branding is really, really important. Um, you know, the Marine Corps has had the same message and brand for a long time. The few, the proud, the brave, the Marines. It hasn't changed for decades, right? Uh, the Army has changed their message multiple times. Remember Be All You Can Be? It was one of the most successful campaigns in military history, right? Uh, but they changed and they adapted. But the Minnesota Guard, we really haven't changed ours so much. I mean, we've got the 34th Future Division Red Bull brand that's out there. That's a visual brand. But this idea of always ready, always there, this idea that we live here, we work here, and serve here, we haven't changed that for a long time. And so through Chris's team and the efforts in the recruiting, we're all on point on the same message. Like we're all tied to the same thing. So I'd ask and challenge you, hey, what is your message for your brand? Do people know what it is and what it stands for? You know, and going back to being a trusted institution, it's all tied to that brand awareness and trust in your brand. And so everything we do focuses on fostering that and growing that across the board. So really, if you've got a good message and a good campaign, uh, then what changes? I think what changes is how you deliver the message, right? Mm -hmm. And so in our, in our uh, Minnesota Guard, recognizing Minnesota's changing across the board demographically, you know, we're doing a better job in understanding where it's changing and how to message it. Like, what's the value proposition in joining? You know, a lot of folks don't realize that a lot of our foreign-born applicants that come come from countries where the military is corrupt or it's not trusted. Uh, and so we have to recognize that a lot of times it isn't the applicant you have to convince. you got to convince mom and dad or the grandparents. That's right. And so think about who you have to message beyond that person you're trying to reach and think about what matters to them. And so we really focus in on that. Um, and this is why we do a lot of community engagement, all right, so that we can build that trust and brand awareness. Thank you, Colonel. Rachel, any additional thoughts? Yeah. I yell at my kids all day. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to play off the what matters to them piece. Um, I'm going to take it in a slightly different angle. I hope that's OK. Sure. Um, but how to know what matters to your employees, right? You need to ask, and you need to ask several times a year. Um, it is an expectation of all of our people leaders that they're having career development conversations with all of their employees. And it's formalized. It's a documentation that's in a system that you, it's a living, breathing document, you update it whenever, but the expectation is that we have those conversations at least twice a year. And, and these are career growth conversations, so not everyone aspires to be a people leader, but the point is to have the conversation. What's important to you? How do you want to grow? And what can I do to support you? you know, or what else would you need in your career development journey to, to be supported? And so, and so it starts 
right there. I think having a personal and meaningful conversation, um, communicating openly with our employees and then, and then delivering on that. Um, but then the second uh, communication strategy that we just recently launched, which has been really fun to see, it's, it's in conjunction with the CGP, the Career Growth Conversation, but it's career spotlights. So then we're selecting people all throughout the organization and we're highlighting their careers. We're highlighting that it's not always this linear path up, right? Like there's, there's lateral moves and sometimes you'll take a step back to learn a new skill to propel you in a totally different place or function. Um, the point is you have to see it. You have to understand that there's this wide landscape of possibilities and then really start to tease out, so what are the skills I need to get me from where I am today to where I want to be? Um, so it's, it's, it's a long process, it's a journey, but it starts with the conversation and it also starts with highlighting different paths and people who have done it, maybe non-traditionally, and, and then helping to support those individual uh, employees. Thank you, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Isaac, any additional thoughts? Uh, absolutely, you know, one of the things is when we're talking about it, and especially bringing it back into the spirit of the Hispanic marketing piece, is when you are approaching those folks, it's important to have, and, and you wanna be able to recruit from the different uh, uh, demographics, building those leaders internally so that they can see and address and embrace that cultural piece of the incoming, of the person who is maybe just, just being a prospective employee. You have to have that, that look, you have to have that um, feel. And then within, it, within that, being able to address what are the cultural differences even within, like we've t been talking about the ERG. And, I, and one, one example that always comes to mind is, you know, Minnesota's one of the largest areas for having a Cinco de Mayo festival. Well, Cinco de Mayo is very much a Mexican thing. So going into your employee base and asking someone who is from Venezuela, how do we do this? It doesn't connect, you, it's a complete miss. And so you have to be sensitive to that. And I don't say sensitive is to do not touch. I'm saying sensitive is to just be aware and know what, what works and what doesn't work. And you have to have that deep dive into that. Good point, Isaac, thank you. Um, as I listen to the panelists, I, I think of um, how do you make your brand relevant to a multicultural audience? And my experience is that you don't change your brand values. You have a set of values that represent the brand, and in some cases, it's represented the brand for 150 years. You're not gonna change your brand values just because you're targeting or going pursuing a different market segment. What you do is you align the brand values with the cultural values of the audience. What makes your values feel Hispanic? What makes your values feel African American? You align those values and you communicate those values to your audience and the audience, which they often said to me is, before today I understood what Allstate was, today I feel what Allstate is. It's creating that, that emotional connection with the brand. We have one more, one more topic to discuss. Recruitment strategies to connect with multicultural communities. Very much related to the last question, but, but maybe there's a twist here that Isaac can share with us. Uh, thank you. So when I think about what the main strategy, and, I, and for me the priority, the main strategy that should top everything is understanding where that talent pool is gonna come from. Understanding the, the, the Hispanic market in particular in regards to uh, seeing it as not just the current talent pool because the US Latino has the highest labor force participation rate and has been for years. And understanding that it's the future talent pool to consider because the US Latino on average is 30 years old in comparison to all the other demographic, the general population, which is 42. So we're younger. We also are now being more educated and we've increased 90% in, uh, the US Latino has re increased 90% in receiving bachelor's degrees. And so now we're gonna be operating at not just um, areas that we overrepresent, uh, services, 
restaurant, hospitality, things like that. Um, but we're also going to be in higher level uh, and should be in higher level C-suite uh, positions. We need to be uh, added to boardrooms. We need to uh, be given opportunities and not opportunities with an equal outcome, but an equal opportunity to achieve. Uh, as owners, when you want to retain when you want to retain Latino talent, you have to provide a platform where they can be taught, be uh, developed as leaders so they can recruit more of the Latino talent, which is the highest labor force uh, participation rate. That's where the workforce is at. And then also be able to make those decisions at that high level that's culturally sensitive. And when you do that as a long-term strategy, and you're building that pipeline, because the pipeline matters, you're gonna have that growth long term. If you're looking to just fill the gap right now, that can be done in a number of different ways. But when you're looking to fill that leadership role, when you're looking to fill those C-suite roles, those opportunities are there and they have to be presented. Um, there's a couple of other pieces that I wanted to point out, is that, uh, Let's see here, the household formation rate accounted for more than 25% of all new households formed the last year, this last year, and the rate continues to climb. So that's where the workforce is coming from, and these folks, they're powerful and they're talented. And so if you're not understanding this, you run the risk of losing that market share, not just within the product or service that you have, but also within the, the talent in the workforce that you have. Um, because here's two, two pieces of information. When you throw in all those other stats, the Latino community, they tend to go where the work is. We're, we, there's lots of evidence saying that we will go where the work is. So if we have those opportunities in other areas, we will go there. The, third, the second piece is that we are very entrepreneurial. In the last year, somewhere of 80% uh, of all new business startups came from the Latino community. And what that tells me is that if you're not being treated right at work, we're gonna go find our own thing. And so now that's part of that retention question as well as the recruiting piece. Excellent, Isaac. Uh, Colonel, uh, any additional thoughts on that topic? I guess I'll, I'll focus in on the retention piece. Uh, I mentioned a while ago the amount of effort we put in our community engagement about being present in the community. So going back to the ERG piece, um, I'll use Pride as an example. Uh, we were at Pride last, last year, a two-day event in Minneapolis. Um, we had an amazing turnout of our service members coming to want to support the booth, to talk about the National Guard, but more importantly, it was the senior leaders that showed up. So I would challenge you, if you have a community engagement program, or, and if you don't, you should have one, but think about who should be there, because I will tell you, having senior leaders at these events uh, resonates well with your members, right? It tells you that, that that you put value in the community they come from. Even it might be a community that you're not familiar with, not comfortable with, um, it was really important to have senior leaders, senior leaders there. And, but the conversations were so genuine and so authentic. Uh, I got a lot of it personally as well. So I would say being president of the community is one thing, but who from the organization is going to these events? Who else should be there? And I would say get your senior leadership there involved because they'll often find and realize that they didn't know their soldier airmen that well until they spent a day with them. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel. Rachel. Um, I don't know how. I mean, yes. Yes, and. <laughs> um, you know, maybe the only other thing I would add, um, and again, just spot on, I think you got to be present. You got to be out there. Um, we, you know, the pandemic was really hard for everyone for a lot of different reasons. And your presentation brought me back to those days. Um, one of the unintended positive outcomes that we found after the pandemic was how powerful the ability to recruit virtually is. Um, we saw an increase in our ability to hire and retain diverse talent um, at a more increased clip because we were able to be more virtual, because that required, that allows the candidate to be more flexible, that allows them to um, you know, a whole host of, of scheduling needs that we all have throughout the day. It really opened up opportunities for candidates that we had a hard time to reach previous to that. Um, so I would say, you know, absolutely engaging in your community. Always be recruiting. We're always, 
Well, that's what we share with all of our, you know, 120,000 employees. We're always recruiting, so please, wherever you are, um, engage, engage. But, um, but also, we did find virtual recruiting be quite advantageous, and the speed to be able to provide the offer to the candidate, we shaved off about 17 days on average just by having the flexibility of being virtual, and that matters. That's a whole pay period for some folks, right? So, um, so I would consider that in your strategies. Thank you, Rachel. Mm -hmm. A couple of comments as we close the panel discussion. Um, a, a mentor, a wise woman once told me, Ray, if you want to really succeed in your organization, become a master of the corporate culture. We talk about multicultural audiences and communities. Guess what? Your organization has a culture of its own. So as individuals, we must master that culture and help those we mentor do the same so that you can perform the best you can within the organization. The last comment I have is disruptive times are coming tomorrow. You'll wake up tomorrow morning, and there'll be a new crisis your organization's facing, maybe the nation's facing. So start planning today. Thank you very much.